know, I was kind of joking, but I mean, some of us love football, and some of the best thing about school starting is that football season starts. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not really the best thing about school starting. The best thing about school starting is events like these, where we can get excited about what's coming, and we can get ideas to help us. Um, and in spring, we did a flex activity with Rob Johnstone. How many of you were at that one? Oh, good. Quite, quite oh. a few. <coughs> so that was kind of an introduction <coughs> to this concept. But today, we have guests who have implemented portions of this concept at their college. So we have two individuals from Baking Stove College, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave. <laughs> um, but I want to start off by introducing Leslie Bond. She serves as the Director of Student Success and Equity at Bakersfield. Um, she's a college facilitator for the American Association of Community College Pathways Project and is working on an operational team on the launch of the California Guided Pathways Project. Um, she transitioned to Bakersfield from Scripps College, where she served as a career counselor, and she earned her BA from the University of North Carolina, um, and her master's in college student affairs administration from the University of Georgia. So, Leslie. Our second presenter is Dr. Nick Strobel. He's been teaching at Bakersfield for 21 years, and he is also uh, teaches physical uh, science courses, and he serves as the planetarium director. So kind of cool. <laughs> um, he's on the Bakersfield College Guided Pathways Implementation Team, and he's the faculty communication lead for the California Guided Pathways Project. He earned his MS and his PhD in astronomy from the University of Washington. Did you ever go to Washington? <laughs> <laughs> so let's All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How, how are you? We're good? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm trying to avoid using the microphone, if at all possible. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And they weren't lying when they said that Brian worked all summer. I had calls with him multiple times, and Lee and Emmanuel, and um, all of the folks here who were helping us understand a little bit more about Moore Park, the work that you're doing, um, the students that you serve. And so it's really exciting for us to be here. And then I kind of roped Nick in um, late in the game and am so thankful that Nick was able to join because he's able to bring a faculty perspective that I don't have. So I hope that there's a balance here that, that you see and throughout the presentation that you'll see uh, a little bit more about our approach to integrating the work of Guided Pathways across student affairs and instruction. Uh, so to introduce myself, you heard the introduction from Lisa. Thank you so much. Um, and we came into this work, both Nick and I, um, because we have a very energetic president um, mm -hmm. who is not very afraid of <laughs> new initiatives. She doesn't chafe at that very, very much. Um, and so she pulled us in, and the work happened long before I ever got to the campus. Nick has been there longer than I have. Um, and in our day-to-day, -day, we absolutely are doing the work of Guided Pathways. But in a more formal way, I do serve as the uh, campus facilitator for our AACC Guided Pathways project. And we're replicating that project here in California. And I'm working with the Advisory Council and our president, Sonia Christian, to get that going. And Nick, if you want to talk a little bit about your role in communication. Yeah, I've been uh, helping uh, the, uh, our college president, uh, Sonia, um, in communicating some of the philosophy, you know, behind Guided Pathways. Uh, if you've received, uh, say, you know, the, the, our Trailblazers uh, letter, uh, I've uh, help, been helping with that. So some of, you know, the communication work. Uh, and, and also uh, wrote, uh, co-wrote an, an article that appeared in the academic, the state academic senate's rostrum, you know, about guided pathways. Why did we? Why are we doing guided pathways? Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion, of course, you know, going on in California about that. And so it's like, why are we doing this? Um, and so uh, I've been helping it in that effort. I, I'm also on, you know, one of the fact we have several faculty mm -hmm. that are on our implementation team. You know, trying to put all the okay, we've got all this theory stuff. How do we actually put this into practice? And we are. Still, you know, we are working on that. Um, a little bit later on, we're going to be talking about uh, completion teams, and that really is starting to wrap up for us. It, you know, this fall, and uh, um, it, well, there's going to be iterations <laughs> going <laughs> along the way. So, you know, we're still in the learning process. Absolutely. Um, when Brian contacted me, he's like, "How did you do this at BC?" <laughs> I was like. 
how are we doing this yeah, at BUC? Yeah, yeah. Because we're still very much in the process. I don't know that it's ever something that you have fully accomplished. Um, and I think getting comfortable with that is something that will be important. So if you can kind of sit with that as we move through. Um, so there are a few main things that we wanted to touch on today. There were a lot of you who were here when Rob Johnstone came to speak in spring. And um, Rob is a fantastic speaker, and he really gives a wonderful 30,000-foot view of what Guided Pathways are, right? But does he get to the operational of what this looks like in your day-to-day your -day work? Um, not usually, right? He doesn't work on a college campus. He's not navigating bureaucracy and business processes and how do you change this and we can't hire 3,000 advisors to serve students individually. Um, so what does it actually look like? And what does it look like for your campus? Because what we are doing at BC may or may not translate to Moore Park. Um, so we want to go back to kind of Guided Pathways 101 um, with a little bit more detail and how we've started to make meaning of these sort of essential characteristics of Guided Pathways. So we'll provide kind of an introduction of that and talk a little bit about what that could mean for your work. But more than that, we will go into what that means for our work at BC. So we'll break down what we call these four pillars of Guided Pathways and give examples of the work that we've done to support those pathways in the development, or those pillars in their development to um, our overall Guided Pathways framework. Give you some of those examples, a little bit of data that we're seeing as we're moving through the process. Um, and then we'll talk really specifically about our own timeline and implementation strategy. So we have um, been deeply engaged in the work with an implementation team for only about a year now. Mm -hmm. um, but long before that, we were doing the work. We just didn't have the vocabulary to call it Guided Pathways, right? So um, identifying when did this work start for you and what are the very meaningful steps that you can take along the way to ensure that it moves forward in a coordinated, sort of orchestrated effort. Um, and then I, we want to wrap up by getting you all to think a little bit about where you are uh, at Moore Park in your readiness to implement um, guided pathways. In our application for the AACC Pathways Project, that helped us really think about where we were as a college, what were our strengths, and what were those friction points, uh, the places where we get stuck as an institution. And so we want to, to be able to give you some of those tools to think about. I do have a lot of materials on a flash drive that I'm going to leave with Brian so that you all can get them electronically. I didn't want to pass out a lot of pieces of paper that will just end up, I know I have a really big Mary Poppins bag where things end up when I get them in paper. Um, so hope to provide you some templates and things that you can refer back to so that you don't have to recreate the wheel. So we won't have a lot of print materials for you today, but know that we will, as we reference thing, things, be able to get them to you after. Okay, questions about this? Well, another thing I want to just uh, point out, at, I guess at the very beginning of all of this, is that um, Guided Pathways is, you know, it's an integrating framework of a lot of the things that, have, that we've already been working on, you know, different colleges. And there are, there are different ways of implementing this. Uh, it's, not, it's not a cookie cutter. So, you know, we will pre be presenting, well, this is what we did at <laughs> Bakersfield College. These are sort of the types of issues that we came, you know, across, and this is how we, uh, well, are trying to solve the, the problems. <laughs> you know, we're still, you know, we're still in process. Um, but, you know, recognizing that some of these things will, will translate to more park and others won't. You know, each, each college has their own culture. And, and so you... Just be aware of, please be aware of that, that, that it is not a cookie cutter type of a thing. Okay, so. And with that, um, if you have questions throughout, we want to welcome those during the presentation. So I'm not saving Q&A for the very end when your mind is kind of <coughs> swirling. Um, please jump in and ask us questions. If we're using these jargon terms related to guided pathways we haven't yet described to you, Please ask for clarity. Um, I remember, and I was telling Nick this, when I was first sitting in a session at Guided Pathways 101, I felt thoroughly overwhelmed and uh, completely um, terrified, really, of the thought of the amount of work that it was going to take to get to this you know, amazing integrated framework they kept talking about. And Nick said, well, isn't that how students feel when we bring them to our campus? 
that probably. Um, so, so we want to give you that kind of clarity that we're asking you to try to develop for your students. So please jump in. We welcome that. Um, and we will have some kind of built-in structure time for Q&A as we go throughout. Okay? So to start, we want to um, ask you all, I've got a stack of index cards here, if you could just pass them around. Um, and we want to know what is your number one burning question about guided pathways. For many of you in the room, I know we have new faculty, new classified in the room. Um, what the heck are they? <laughs> what are you even talking about today? Might be your question, and that's great. That's actually probably the most common question that we get. For some of you, it might be, isn't that a CTE thing, and how does that relate to me? Um, but more often than not, we hear, how will it affect my work? Yeah, that's all good. That sounds really great. But what does that actually mean for me? Um, so if you all could record that question that you have, and then at the end of our session today, we want to hear from you just a yes or no, whether or not we answered your question. And that will give us a good sense of how we did in meeting your needs and will help us collect some of those questions for the next time that we go out to present to a group. Okay? So I'll give you just a couple minutes to do that. Okay, does anybody want to share their burning question? That's a great question. So Brian asked, um, it, you know, we, we aren't getting massive amounts of money pouring into our institutions to implement guided pathways. So how are we um, scaling this kind of work to meet the needs of students? Are we adding more counselors, or are we just rethinking the work that the folks on campus are doing? And we will definitely talk about that. Mm -hmm. Can you share your name and title? Awesome. So Mary's question uh, was, what is the one thing that you wish you knew when you set out that would have helped you streamline this process? And we have a few lessons learned for sure, so we will definitely work that in. In the back. Great question. And are you a librarian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So our librarian asked, how does the library and other support services um, uh, play into this role? So if we are not directly in a student services position or a faculty member, what role do you have to play? How will that affect your day to day? Good question. And I think it really relates to the question that Brian asked. Critical question, how did we ensure faculty buy-in and engagement in the process? And that might relate to Mary's question a little bit of what did we wish we would have done early on. We'll talk about that. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, so a question about the student perspective on guided pathways. What do we communicate to them maybe and how do they understand guided pathways as being critical in their success? Okay. A question about integration, which Nick will talk about. We have a really great visual that I think will help you begin to make some sense, right? We all have 40, 60, 70 hour jobs, right? Um, with a lot of different requirements to meet. And in California in particular, we've seen a lot of support, but it's been maybe a little disjointed. Um, and things are coming out here and there, so how do we wrap our arms around it? We definitely will talk about that. I'd love to know how you determine what your, uh, your successful outcome would be so as to measure the reality. Mm -hmm. um, and th that's a great question, still under development. But what is, how do we know that we've been successful in this? Um, do we have measurable outcomes? Are we tracking them? How do we know we've arrived, in a sense? Um, we're still absolutely in the midst of it and shaping that as we go, but we'll get into some of those metrics in the presentation. The far back. I think from my framework, that will guide you until we have teachers to be independent as members of society without getting into too much pressure. Right. How do you provide flexibility and yet the structure that the students need to get to a goal with room for exploration? Is that what I'm hearing? Right. Sure. So how do we help students build that independence and resilience that we know that they need to be successful while still providing the structured support that they need, but not crossing the line to hand holding? Any others before we move on? Okay, so I'm, I'm really thankful that you all chimed in because I think that we will be covering essentially every one of those questions that you asked in some way. But if we don't, please, again, like I said, challenge us on, challenge us on it and ask us further questions. So to dive in, how many, again, in the room were here when Rob Johnstone came to speak? Okay, so about half of you were here when he was here. And did he talk about the cafeteria model? Yeah. So this is a slide kind of straight from the book, Redesigning America's Community Colleges. And that is really the um, galvanizing literature that has helped uh, a lot of the researchers throughout the country to give sort of roots to what it is that we're trying to talk about. And they frame um, what community colleges has, have been doing as a cafeteria model. You go through the line, you pick and choose what you want, you, put th you leave things that you don't want, um, and you might end up with a hodgepodge of stuff at the end, right? The guided pathways model provides a little bit more structure and clarity, maybe healthier options for the student um, that we know that they need. So this is a really great framework. This particular table, I think, is helpful in, in giving us some direction and where we want to go. But for us, and this is maybe to Mary's point, it was a little too much and you know, up in the air. It's the 30,000 foot view. So we kind of broke the phrasing guided pathways down a bit further. Um, how many of you have, have heard pathways as sort of a CTE concept? A few of you. I know at our college that was a big, a big thing. We had CTE pathways, and we had lots and lots of promotional material about our CTE pathways. Um, but we weren't talking about our pathways to transfer as prominently, and we weren't really focused as strongly on the guidance part. So when I, I put this up here, and I know it might be hard for you in the back, but does anything jump out to you all about the um, two primary columns here? and what is really required for the Guided Pathways model? Uh, the K-16 step that you're, you're talking about, uh, backwards planning, I suppose, is mm -hmm. the way. So Brian mentioned the K-16 step, which is right here. So starting earlier in a student's journey before they ever get to us, maybe. Anything else? 
So, mm-hmm. exactly. So, student support and instruction. Nick and I are a good example of this. Guided Pathways really mandates the integration of student support and instruction. So no longer in a college with a Guided Pathways framework can you really operate in a place where the student services folks figure out what to do with advising and they operate in their silo and the instruction folks really manage their classes and their schedules and, and, and that kind of thing. Instead, it requires cross-functional teams, cross-functional conversations, um, to really look at the student experience as a holistic experience. So that was really critical for us at our institution of working to develop into our own structures, um, our meeting times, everything like that, that we have representatives from across the board. Because our advising model is only as strong as how well it reflects our instructional model, right? So being much more intentional about what's happening with me as a faculty, what's happening with student services. Um, and you know, later on we're gonna talk about the completion teams that really bring all of the different people uh, together. So uh, um, you know, we talk about guided pathways as an integrated framework and really just putting every, all the different pieces together and so for me, it's, it's been helpful to see, well, where do I fit you know, in this whole big process of, of getting a student that, that enters to finally graduating? It's a heck of a lot more than just them attending my, my class. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that go into that. And it, it's been helpful for me to sort of visualize you know, my, my piece, uh, my part of that whole thing. Okay, so now that we've got sort of this idea that Guided Pathways will require this integration, we have um, worked to develop language about the four pillars of Guided Pathways. AACC, which set out with their uh, AACC Pathways project in 2015, called them essential practices. These are the things that we need to do well in order for a student to get in and get through and out on time. And um, our president has helped us put them into this, this image, which has stuck for us finally. So it's that, that piece that if we had this on day one, I think we would have been miles ahead and it, it, things would have picked up more quickly. Once we had these four pillars to reference, things have really started to crystallize for us. So pillar number one is clarify the path. And we'll talk more about what each of these means. Pillar number two is enter the path. Pillar three is stay on the path, and pillar number four is ensure learning. And something important to note here is that each of these pillars is of equal importance. So you'll see that, um, for example, ensure learning, um, which we know is very heavy in instruction, is just as important as the student support work that happens to bring them onto campus and provide them clarity in getting onto that, that pathway. So I'll talk about these first two pillars and then I'll hand it over to Nick to talk about the second two. So our president um, has kind of coined this term for us that we need to provide relentless clarity. Um, and that for me has been, um, you know, this constant kind of mantra in my head that this is about kind of hitting them over the head with clarity, providing them all of the resources and tools that they possibly could ever want or need without ever having to talk to a person necessarily on campus. So this includes really early high school engagement. Um, we've got defined competencies at the outset. What do they expect of me? What should I learn in this process so that I know what I'm getting myself into? And then by grouping our programs of study. So for us, it has been critical, and we'll talk a lot more about this, um, to break down this giant um, offering of programs. We have 72. Does anybody know how many you have? How many? 73. <laughs> OK. And you have how many students? Okay, so 12,000 students and 73 programs. And that's, that's really great, provide students options, but how do those students make sense of those options? And even within those 73, there are different pathways that they can take. There are different transfer institutions and transfer patterns and 
We in California like to make things complicated and have a whole lot of those. Um, so that for us has been critical of making some sense of that for the student um, and involving them in helping us understand what they need to make sense of it. Pillar number two is entering the path, and, and for me as the Director of Student Success and Equity, I oversee SSSP and Equity, those two grants. I don't know if my counterpart is in the room here. Um, so this particular pillar is very deeply connected to my work on a day-to-day -day basis, and a lot of that is about how do we onboard them, not only to the campus, but to their program of study. So we do our matriculation steps, um, and we know that those are really successful. We bring them in through a really intensive summer bridge. Today is our last day of it. Um, it's which been going is, on all summer long. All summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and our educational planning, putting a major emphasis on early educational planning to onboard them to that program of study, getting them in the right courses. Great question. We'll talk a little bit more about Bridge. Um, right now, our Bridge is reaching about 1,500 incoming students. It's targeted at those coming straight in from high school. Um, it's a very intensive one-day experience with a curriculum that is managed by our Academic Development Department, which is our department for remedial, some <laughs> of our remedial courses. Um, and all, it's a faculty engagement strategy for us as well. So it's, a, it's an incoming, it's a requirement for our new faculty who come in to participate as mentors in a summer bridge. So right now we're at yeah, about 15. It started 15. out small. <laughs> you know, it started out small yeah. uh, with, oh, uh, maybe like 50 or so students. Like, if that. Okay, if that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was and giddy. then, you know, the next year it grew to over 100, and, and it's been building up, you know. Well, we want to, uh, for Summer Bridge, we want to require this of all students coming in. Um, and that's sort of our eventual goal. Absolutely. As Leslie said, you know, it's about 1,500 right now. And, um, and what we, I think we have a slide in there about the success rates, you know, the students that do bridge, how well they do compared to others. And it's, it's really, really, so we know it's, they definitely need it. <laughs> and Nick has led Summer Bridge in the past, right? Well, I, when I'm, we were in the 500 not, well, range. Well, I would say I've led. I've helped. <laughs> <laughs> helped <laughs> with it. I mean, Kimberly is the, is Kimberly, the uh, Kimberly Blythe or is our uh, one who's really put together the whole yeah. summer bridge. So I would say she's really led it. So our department <laughs> chair of academic development is the, the bridge queen. Um, and I would have loved to have her here because if you get her talking about bridge, she can just go and go and go. Um, and we secured a Title V grant. Um, a couple years ago to help really um, support the bridge and now we're also using our SSSP and equity dollars to scale it. Um, so right now at 1500 we have about 6,000 incoming students um, and we, we're doing a really good job of reaching those coming directly from high school, having a harder time with those entering from another place, but our goal would be for every single student, right? And that is with Guided Pathways, the goal is that every single student experiences the campus in the way that they need to experience it. And our research is showing us Bridge is a way they probably need to experience it. Other questions about entering the path? We'll give some more examples of what we do here and some of our success rates. Okay, and you want to talk about stay? Okay, so uh, staying on the path, um, you know, once we get the students on the path, uh, we find that, well, at, at Bakersfield College, we had a, a, a vast majority, great majority of <laughs> folks wouldn't complete, so, uh, wouldn't complete their, their degree or their certificate. Uh, we had a really high, uh, uh, well, uh, leakage <laughs> or dropout, <laughs> however you want to say it. And so how do we keep them, you know, on that path, particularly because it can take a, you know, a long time. So, you know, we have up there academic support, all the, the beyond the, the classroom, extending the classroom. Uh, things like, well, at the Bakersfield College, so we'll talk maybe a little bit about the, the writing center, tutoring, um, the uh, supplemental instructions, all these other things of helping the, the students outside of the, the classroom to be successful, you know, in the classroom. Um, you know, learning communities is, is also part of that, and the co-curricular activities. You know, well, for example, say how would how would clubs help you know, student engagement? Um, having them plug into the what's happening on campus so that they will 
uh, you know, complete. Something I want to highlight here is that um, in terms of staying on the path for us, this has been the biggest piece, or I think the biggest focus for Bakersfield College. And it's been the part where we've really gotten some clarity around how to engage the campus as a community. Everyone is responsible for keeping students moving toward their goal. Um, and I think if we were to pinpoint our reason why we set out to do guided pathways, we looked at that six year completion rate and it's, it's pretty yeah. dismal. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, at, least for, at least we know for Bakersfield College um, that the, our success rates were, were really low. Mm -hmm. You know, we got on to the, 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 the national project, not because we were doing well, but because <laughs> we needed help. <laughs> um, and, um, also, as part of the stay on the on the path, this whole idea of the, the completion teams, and where we have you know, we have disciplined faculty, we have the department chairs, we have the deans, we have uh, counselors, we have financial aid uh, helping out with that. We have you know library support, whatever. All of these uh, people working together to uh, well either completion teams or coaching uh, teams. However you want completion coaches is what we're calling all of these uh, different uh, folks that are on those teams. Um, and the way of you're surrounding the, the, the students with, you know, with the support. And we'll go into that really in depth um, later on. And I think that speaks to you in the back. I didn't get your name. But how do you, <laughs> how do you engage a lot of different areas on campus to be responsible for that, but also not every single student is going to get, you know, that individual touch. We have 30,000 students um, and just simply not enough humans to do that. It'd be great if we had one person for every student, but we don't. So trying to um, wrap our arms around that in manageable groups has been our major strategy. So, yeah, in this one we'll talk about, say, with the, yeah, with the completion teams and then also a little bit about the technology. With, okay, with 30,000 students, how do we uh, do it with, you know, with a limited number of personnel? So there's, a, there's the high tech and then there's the high touch. <laughs> how do we combine those? And we are, you know, we, are, we are learning, still in the learning process of that. And then ensure learning, you know, all of this is for naught if the students aren't, aren't learning. So how do we know that they are learning? So, uh, you know, the, I also consider this sort of like uh, almost bookends. We have pillar one, which is clarifying the path. And there you're looking at all the, see, the different outcomes, the student learning outcomes uh, for the courses and then the programs. And then this piece here is, well, you know, this is the, really the assessment piece then. How do you know that the students really are learning? Um, and so uh, uh, this, you know, we're, uh, as part of the clarifying the path pillar one, is you know, looking at the, with the end goal in mind of the students either transferring or, or getting a job. What sort of things do they need to know to either you know, transfer on or to get that job? And then working backwards to create uh, all the, well, to create the path along the way. What's the course sequence that they really do need to, to take? Um, and then uh, really assessing uh, all of that. So before we get really deep into the work that we're doing at BC, I wanted to try to define for you, and I know there's a lot of text here, but I provided a full glossary in the document that I will give um, Brian after this, try to define some of the key terms that we are using. So we just talked about completion coaching. We talked about grouping majors, and we're calling those meta majors, at least internally, um, versus a program of study or a pathway. So a completion coach, I wanted to highlight that it's about a cross-functional team. It is a whole college wraparound for the student, but we've broken that up into manageable pieces by organizing it by meta major. And the meta major is a grouping of programs of study, so if you have 73, breaking that up into programs that share similar competencies, similar goals for the student, maybe similar uh, job outlooks, for the student, you can define how you want to organize them. Um, some schools really approach it in a very kind of linear way. It does every single gen ed requirement match up. For us, it's a little more loose, at least at the start. We're just trying to give students a place to jump into um, and a place to explore if they're really kind of unsure. 
How many students do we get who say they're going to be a nurse, right? And they're probably not going to be a nurse, um, but maybe they could go into vocational nursing, or maybe they would really enjoy um, you know, whatever other health field that could fall under that health sciences umbrella, right? So it's a way to introduce students to the college without that overwhelming um, array of options. Um, I know for me, whenever I was entering college as a first-gen student, I would have never been able to define for you anthropology. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, I'm interested in the behavior of people, but I would not have been able to pinpoint anthropology. So how do we help give them some of that um, information? And that is how we're using our meta majors. Versus a program of study is that specific major. So nursing is a program of study. Anthropology is a program of study. But it might fall within a meta major. And the pathway really is that holistic experience across all four pillars. So the pathway begins long before they reach us and long after they leave us. And it's all of the pieces of their experience that we know uh, help make them successful. So it's defining the milestones and helping them understand um, how do they navigate and what are those momentum points that we want to pinpoint and track to know that we've been successful. So those are kind of four of the main terms I think we'll toss out there. If we toss out others, please challenge us. How many meta majors do you have we have 10 meta majors. And we have eight affinity groups. And we'll talk about those and why we've chosen to break it out that way. I'll give you a sense of that. Uh, and Leslie used uh, also a term, first generation student. Does that, are we OK on that? <laughs> OK. All right. So nobody in their, in their family history has gone to college uh, before. Um, and so they don't have that sort of college history, culture type of a background for them. And for Bakersfield College, one of the main reasons why we went with guided pathways is because, uh, well, 80 to I'd say 85 percent of our students are considered first generation students. Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of the students, they, when we give them this huge, big, bewildering array of, of courses, it's like, uh, I know high school. I had one major. <laughs> it was high school. Complete. Okay. <laughs> And you're going to present me with, OK, at BC, 72 choices. And each of those has, OK, there's the, the college, the BC Gen Ed track. There's the I get C track. The, there's a the CSU. Really? <laughs> and, and we'll show that. <laughs> so that's the thing. You know, Our students are like, we, we don't know how to do college at all. They haven't had that uh, history at all. So that's part of the providing the clarity. So yeah, we'll get into that. But anyway, I wanted to make sure we understood, you know, yeah. first generation and, you know, really it was a big thing for us. It's huge it for us. It was really eye opening <laughs> for me when I when I first heard that figure, you know, a few years ago. So. And I'm really happy that your president shared his experience of feeling kind of timid, you know, to ask for help or I don't even know the questions to ask. I don't know what I don't know. Um, and that is something we definitely see. So when we talk about the clarity, the relentless clarity, it's because students don't really know the types of questions that they need to ask to be successful. And even if they do, maybe they don't feel comfortable. They haven't found people you know, they can connect with. So some of that has, has been really driven by this equity agenda that we have. When I was thinking about that, that connection to equity, which you're going to know about too, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the key terms I heard from equity is this idea of intrusive intervention. Yeah. Right. So is that part of your your model as well? Like like really getting it into the student. Mm -hmm. you, know, you reach out to them instead of waiting for them. Right. right. So Brian's question is about um, you know we talk a lot about equity and at our community colleges we have this equity funding and intrusive interventions is this kind of common catchphrase that we use when talking about that. And what that means is going to the student and meeting them where they are. And is that a part of guided pathways? And 100% it is guided pathways, right? It is intrusive. It is tracking students down to a certain level of detail and making sense of a group of 30,000 students and bringing them to where they can be seen. And a student can actually um, feel like they aren't just a number because we're breaking that down. And we will we'll show you our meta majors and our affinity groups, which relates to our equity work. Other questions? Yeah. 
question? Okay. So our philosophy is about the integration. And I'm going to hand this over to Nick to talk about, there was a question earlier about all of these different requirements. And, um, you know, I've, I've got six different grants that I'm overseeing, and I'm also supposed to do X, Y, and Z for student learning outcomes, and I've got to do accreditation work, and we have these committees and that committees, and how do we make sense of all of that? And for us, Guided Pathways is the way that we make sense of all of it. So if you'd like to take the clicker. All right. <laughs> you got it. Not a new initiative. Um, you know, <laughs> California, of course, has uh, thousands upon, th well, okay, let's say hundreds. <laughs> hundreds of different initiatives. So uh, is Guided Pathways just uh, another uh, initiative? And uh, say, no. Um, it's a way of really integrating all the things that we have been doing here in California. We have uh, one of the reasons why we do have, you know, this California Guided Pathways project going on is because of the well, really the huge amount of money that, that our legislature has been given us, has given us uh, over the years, I was at something like $850 million uh, to the, for, okay, SSSP equity is, is some examples of that. Um, and then, uh, you know, so how do we put, put all these together? Let's see. Uh, Okay, do I just click it to get the animation again? <laughs> I can grab it if you want. I think we've got it animated because it's so there overwhelming. There we go. Okay, so here we go. All right, so here are all the different initiatives. So, you know, I know, you know you've been in involved in uh, practically all of these, too, if, if not all of them. And, um, I hear laughter of people recognizing some of the things we've been through. Yeah. Just a few. You see, it seems like sort of a jumble of the, the different things that are, that are up there. So, you know, when we talk about the, the different pillars of some of the work that's been uh, done with that, we, we and, and I know you have all been uh, working on laying the, the foundation uh, for all of this work. So how do we sort of put it all together so then it, it, it makes sense? And are we still going on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can see there's a whole, uh, a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of things that are going on. This particular slide we have up uh, here, I think this is actually when he was uh, at our Leadership Matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks, we got the BC Red in there. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> got the BC Red. Um, so, uh, and I re also recall uh, Chancellor Oakley at the accreditation uh, ACCJC conference. Uh, that was, I think, in January. January? I think it was that. Um, and he raised the same sort of points as well, is that it, the, the legislature really has invested a lot in different student success. Um, you know, $850 million uh, really has been invested over the many, many, well, several years. And, but our success rates, you know, system-wide have been flat. <laughs> and, you know, uh, so, uh, and, and, we've, and we've been telling the legislature, you know, if you do, if we have these things, you know, our students will be successful. Well, eventually we get to the point where, uh, <laughs> You know, if the things are still flat and we've spent all this money, it's like, okay, we, we lose our credibility. And I've, I've definitely been getting the sort of that, I don't know, that vibe uh, from our, our state chancellor, uh, you know, about that. So, um, but, you know, what, uh, what he mentioned um, in that is that, yes, we've been late, we've had these different uh, initiatives, and what Guided Pathways is going to do is going to integrate that so that we really can move to the second level. We've been laying the, the foundation for that. So, legislature, please give us, you know, $150 million <laughs> to implement this, you know, system-wide. Um, but it, it really is sort of, uh, well, this is it. You know, uh, we've been saying we're going to uh, make our students more successful. And now we're really going to see, is this, uh, is this going to happen? Um, of course, he had a lot more to say. I, I also appreciated his uh, comment uh, that, uh, 
he had uh, about his experience when he was a, a community college student. And he was one of the, the lucky ones that made it through, sort of despite the system. Um, he was able to, to be successful. Well, we don't want that to be the experience for our students. The, the ones that do transfer on, you know, why do they do so well? Well, is, is it really a Darwinian process? You know, they are the ones that finally, if they can make it through, you know, the, our, our systems that we have set up, you know, with all good intentions, um, you know, it's not the problem of the people, it's the system that we've, we've set up. And so we are looking at, you know, really changing the system. Um, but if people have been able to get through this system that we have set up and um, somehow get through all of that, well, they really are sort of the, the cream of the crop, best of the best, because then they can transfer on. We don't want it to be that way. And certainly at you know, BC, with our, our, initially our completion rates being so darn low, we know that there was a, a big problem with that. So we, we've got to do something different. And, and that was sort of, uh, for faculty, really being presented with those numbers. Um, you know, the numbers don't lie. <laughs> but it, there, was a, there was resistance to that. But after a while, it's like, here, here's objective reality. And it's not good. So that's what then just finally, OK, we need to do something different. Um, and I think that goes along with what uh, Chancellor Oakley was sort of really getting at also in his comments. Okay. <laughs> now we're... All right, so with the different uh, initiatives then that really have been going on, um, the Guided Pathways is a way of integrating all of these <coughs> things together. So, uh, so in this little animation here, we see, well, here's how this initiative fits in with the pillars. So it, uh, and you can see that really, you know, California, all, all their different colleges, we really have been doing a lot of the work already. So it's not like something totally new. You know, we have been laying the foundation for a long time. It's just putting it uh, together. Uh, and for us sort of realizing that then, it was like, it wasn't so overwhelming. It's like, well, people already really have been doing this sort of a stuff uh, you know, already. But maybe not as efficiently <laughs> as we could have been. So right, it, it helps to have you know, this framework in right. mind so you see where you, where you fit in all of that. And you know, equity, social mobility, economic health, you know, for a system-wide uh, um, really democratizing <laughs> education, college education for well, certainly, you know, as I said, you know, 80 to 85 percent of our students being first generation students, um, the Guided Pathways makes, the, this, uh, makes college less intimidating. Do I have the SSSP equity or BSI kind of lead in the room? Maybe? Okay, multiple people. It is on our campus as well. I, okay, we have BSI. So there's the new integrated plan, right? So we're seeing some movement in pockets toward the integration because we were submitting three separate plans and we were hiring three different people to do work that was supposed to be coordinated. Um, and it probably depends on your campus or whether or not you like each other or whatever in terms of how well that actually happens. Um, <laughs> lovely people. We all love each other. Um, we have that covered as well. So, I mean... Equity and SSSP better integrator. I've got some serious issues. So, um, but our our BSI contact at BC, she and I work very closely together. But it's it it is another step because it is a separate person. So at least the plan is giving us you know that tool to finally look at it from an integrated perspective. So we're seeing some movement. And the idea with 150 million, we have I don't think any real concept of exactly how that's going to pan out. But the idea is that we can move toward further integration of all of these things to make some sense of them um, so that we're no longer operating in these pockets and spending lots of money with maybe not as, as great of an impact as we were hoping to get. Oh, defining competencies and assessing competencies. So we've talked about that piece there and then to the workforce. So we've talked a few times already about our student population, but I wanted to dig in a little bit more to that. So the uh, organizing of all of these initiatives onto this framework 
makes really good logical sense. And for our, many, that's reason enough to do this, right? Um, it just helps me be more efficient in my work, um, have a better, you know, better outcomes for students because, you know, everything's integrated. But for us, it's, it runs deeper than that. And it runs into our equity agenda at the college. Um, and Kern County is a unique little place. And you all, I'm sure, have your unique things that characterize your student population. So to give you some background um, on Kern County, I think you all probably know that uh, Kern County is a big oil and ag center. Has anybody been or just driven through mostly? <laughs> so yeah. most of you have been. Have any of you been in July or August? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh huh. For about eight hundred dollars a month, you can keep your PG&E at a comfortable rate. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. I mean, it's very hot. But it's also, um, you know, a really unique little pocket of blue-collar um, mentality. We've got huge industry presence, and for us, that really influences our work um, because we are the community's college. We do have a four-year institution in Bakersfield, um, CSU Bakersfield. It's our major transfer uh, partner. But the majority of our students, they are first-gen, they aren't college-ready, and they're coming to us before they move on to our, our transfer partners. So for us, we're really informed by our surrounding community. And we're a lot bigger than you might have expected. Um, 375, but if you bring in our unincorporated areas, some figures are as high as 800,000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, really, um, a really large geographic region as well. Um, I know this is small, especially for you in the back, but so you can get a sense here. Um, we are a Hispanic serving institution, so about 65% of our students are Hispanic Latino. Um, and in Kern County, that number is over 50%. So we're, we're doing a pretty good job of representing our community there. Uh, median household income is only $48,000, which leads us to have over 65% of our students on financial aid. And like we said, over 80% are first generation. That number fluctuates year to year. Um, but these are students who have not traditionally had um, the college knowledge or the resources. And we, we don't benefit from a college going culture in our community. So that requires us to go to them. And that's been a big part of our Guided Pathways agenda is going to them. And fortunately, we've had some investment that's made that easier. Okay, before we move on, mm -hmm. I want you to I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. So Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent have uh, of a bachelor's uh, degree. And that number is is Bakersfield, or Kern County as a whole. Um, we at BC serve a lot of rural communities, where one in a hundred have a bachelor's degree. And most of our students are coming in with parents with an eighth grade education at most. I was born and raised in Bakersfield. I don't think Nick was. No, no. Um, and I myself am a first generation college student. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. My mom does have a GED. Um, and none of my siblings have gone to school. So I definitely, whenever I was thinking about coming back to BC, this was my draw. I was working at Scripps College. I don't know if you all know. It's a prestigious liberal arts women's college. Fantastic students, fantastic um, colleagues, but the why wasn't really as present for me. There were 16 first generation students on that campus. <laughs> I was their liaison, so I had my 16. Um, <laughs> but for me, you know, this, this is what drives the work, and it's what drives the work for so many of us who work at BC. So we're not just, you know, and logically this makes good sense to us. We don't we usually work in education because of the money, right? Or the really, you know, fantastic hours, at least for some of us. So um, what is the reason that we're going into this? And, and this is something that we try to keep front and center when we're communicating and getting that engagement and buy-in that you talked about is making sure that we keep this information front and center. Okay, so to break down further, um, we're going to walk through each of these pillars we just introduced and talk about some examples, some specific examples of what we do at BC that you may already be doing or maybe would work for you 
But before we move on to that, are there any Pathways 101 types of questions that you have that were not captured in that first section? I'm glad you asked that question. So his question was, how, um, how are community colleges who are implementing guided pathways um, coordinating with their four-year transfer partners? Is that right? Yeah. Um, and we have a couple of examples of how we're doing that, but I can tell you that system-wide, I don't think we're doing that well. Um, and I'm not the expert on this, but we have two systems who have different transfer patterns and have not ever talked to one another about their transfer patterns and don't appear to have any intention on talking to one another about their transfer patterns. Is that right? Head shaking? Oh, so it's, it's the yeah. same for you. Okay. And I say that, <laughs> I say that because um, at IEPI, we, had, we held a, a Guided Pathways Summit through IEPI. We had two of them. And we had a panel of uh, a CSU rep, a UC rep, and a community college system rep. And somebody in the audience asked them, have you all ever thought thought about getting on the same page here, it would really help us out. And they were kind of like, I don't know her. <laughs> not really. Um, so maybe they're getting there, but it's not something that they're necessarily ahead of the curve. So all we can do is work to inform um, the system of the issues that we see and continue to educate our partners about why this is not serving students. So there's, there's some of that, but we are definitely making an effort. I, I heard your president mention the PROMISE program. That's something that we're doing. And our PROMISE is Guided Pathways. So it's all integrated. And we'll talk some more about that. But yeah, you know, with SB 1440, you know, <laughs> mandating all this, and that CSUs are supposed to take our students as, as juniors. OK, what's the reality? Well, there's some, some do, <laughs> some programs, but others, no. And of course, you know, that depends on, well, how well do the, maybe the, the faculty at the two different uh, uh, institutions work well with each it's it's crazy stuff it's like well yeah it's just cra some of the stuff is pretty crazy so uh, it is we, I mean we're working on it <laughs> you know and I, you know because you are all working on it you know as as well um, but this idea of the you know the guided pathways you know of doing the whole thing from um, high school and and community college being that bridge then on to a bachelor's degree because you know, if they get a bachelor's degree then the the students have a much higher standard of living than, than they would without it so um, yeah uh, it's we're, we're working on it <laughs> yeah that's the end game right I mean and we've seen all of the charts about the wages based on education we know that a bachelor's degree at minimum is our end game if at all possible yes we have an industry in Bakersfield where you can make great money without a high school diploma um, but that's not the quality of life and the the family sustaining kind of wages that we're looking for um, for our students so we're trying to really partner with CSU um, we've done a lot of work with CSUB we're fortunate that we kind of have one target institution and we can hone in on um, but we have a lot a whole lot of work to do Other questions? Brian? So, um, as a person who is into academics and higher education, like, I tend to think about transfer and think about the bachelor's degree. But of course, we're going to have a number of students interested more in GPE and, and kind of career pathways. So, I'm curious about the integration of that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, the question is about integration of transfer pathways and CTE pathways. And a defining characteristic of the Guided Pathways framework is that they no longer live in separate houses, that they are integrated. So for us, our meta majors include programs in CTE and programs in transfer. Um, so if you look at a, if a student looks at a meta major, they have, op they have options ranging from just come here and take a course as a skills builder and you can, can advance in your field, 
or you need to look at transfer, probably a you know, doctorate, you want to be a doctor, or whatever it might be, you can draw blood or you could become a doctor. <laughs> These are all options within our health sciences you know, <laughs> pathway. It's going to take you some time. But... If you're in counting, yeah, you can draw blood. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, so you have a health science nursing, for example, which they're not in the nursing program, they're not nursing majors, but so where do they, and then across the board, you know, for STEM or for whatever med mm -hmm. major they have, how does that impact just, you know, just the health system or the student system? Yeah. That's a great question. So where does financial aid play into a student's pathway? For us at this point, we'll go more in depth. Students are still declaring a program of study, but there is the, the thought behind it is that they will not get hurt in the financial aid process if they move within the meta major. So there's some common shared courses early on in the student's pathway that financial aid will accept because they are common, bio 18 or whatever it might be. You're not going to lose out on your progress and you're not going to get harmed financially if you take some time to explore. The mechanism to change your major is still going to be there in the system for that purpose. And you know, as an example, I'm, you know, I'm in the STEM meta major. So, uh, and we know that for our students, um, that they have to take the, I think it's the math 6A, it's the calculus. And so uh, you know, we've identified that as definitely a common thread throughout and there's uh, and then some other courses. So it's part of identifying the courses so that if they, uh, you know, that first semester, uh, if they, they came in as maybe a biology major, major but the, they end up really being an engineering major, at least for that first semester or two semesters, if there's enough common courses that they're taking, they're not hurt, you know, and so it, then they wouldn't uh, be wasting, burning through their financial aid. Well, yeah, and that's that. But if we provide the clear, you know, yeah. relentless clarity <laughs> of letting them know, okay, this this will be the impact of you changing your major. Uh, one of our other meta majors that we have, and we just had to put this in, is, is the number ten was the exploration one. Okay, student has no idea. Do I want to go into science or do I want to go into business? I have no idea. So uh, and what sort of uh, courses could they take that doesn't threaten their financial aid, you know, too much. But, you know, uh, a lot of students wouldn't know, you know, beforehand because, you know, first-generation students, oh, I can change my major and all of that. Well, okay, here are the consequences of doing that. Um, they didn't have those consequences before. Well, they didn't know the consequences before. So. And I have a personal example <laughs> of... of being on the wrong side of the system, I think, in that. Um, when I went to college, I went to school in North Carolina. And whenever I looked at the out-of-state tuition, it was the exact same as the in-state tuition to a UC. Okay, looks good to me. <laughs> same thing, I got my financial aid here. I'm covered, I'm fine. And I get there, and I, I wasn't aware that I wouldn't qualify for scholarships as a non-resident. I wasn't aware that I didn't qualify for grants as a non-resident. I wasn't aware that I could not get residency if I was enrolled in school. <laughs> so these were all pieces of the puzzle that without that relentless clarity, I ended up with 100% student loans, even though I thought I had an EFC that would get me great grants here. So it's letting the student know up front what could the impact of their decision making be on things like their financial aid. So it's not necessarily hand-holding them and saying, no, you can't. <laughs> you must stay here or you're going to lose out. It's, hey, this is the reality of your decisions. But they know it early enough that they can make informed decisions. Right? Other questions? OK, so let's hop into some of our examples. Um, and you may see, I hope that you will see yourselves in some of this. Um, much of it we, you know, I know that, that throughout California we've been doing well as a system. And then some of it I think is very unique to BC and may or may not translate. 
So back to, well, this is the kind of the, another look at the pillars in a more um, artistic <laughs> rendering. Uh, Nick kind of looks at, he, I had a wordle up, and he's like, I don't get wordles. You know, like, can you just tell me the word? I'm like, well, the wordle gives you this, you know, feeling of what's there. It's too so, <laughs> feely for me, so. <laughs> but what you see essentially is that we're, we're talking about taking the student from before they arrive to campus to, to after they leave. Um, with the ultimate goal in mind. And the metrics are super critical. So how do you know that you're doing this well? Um, how can you shape direction as you progress through the process? And we've started to really develop some common metrics to figure that out. But back to the pillars. So we'll start with clarify the path. So I said that we had 72 programs of study. I'm going to throw us under the bus a little bit. Um, this is a real screenshot from CCC Apply. There are nine screens of this. Um, I didn't <laughs> take all of them. Yeah, so our 72 <laughs> programs turn into 271 lines and nine screens. Um, and if I were a student and I came in and there's an AA of accounting for BC Gen Ed, AA in accounting for CSU Gen Ed, AA in accounting for UC Gen Ed, I get see, what's I get see? I don't know what that means. Um, I get it, but. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens for every single program, right? I heard someone say that's degree works. I get overwhelmed. And I'm probably just going to click AA in accounting with BC Gen Ed. So you have a huge number of accounting majors, right? We're seeing that, absolutely. So when I say that we don't have this completely figured out, we really mean it. But this is, this is one of those stark reminders that this is, this is not OK. <laughs> this is super overwhelming to a student. It's overwhelming to me. And to go through nine screens of this is just absolutely unreasonable. So how many of you are familiar? Do we have any behavioral scientists or business faculty in the room familiar with this study about JAM? <laughs> No one. So the idea behind this study is that um, they set up a display of jam in a, a grocery store. And they wanted to look at consumer behavior. So they set up a display with 24 different options. And they had a display at a different time with six different options. And the display with 24 different options, um, shop, shoppers sampled the same amount, but got about 60% of people came over and like, let me check this out but only 3% ended up buying something after they sampled. While the six choices only attracted about 40% of people, 30% of them walked away with something. So the idea that the satisfaction with the choice options is higher when there are fewer is really critical, I think. So we talk about how do we let students still explore, and we want to give them as many options as possible. But then they get there and they're like, but what if I'm missing out? Oh, yeah. It's like hashtag choice FOMO. Choice paralysis <laughs> is what they call it. So it's choice paralysis, right? So this is how we sort of started to frame our approach to providing clarity to students, that we know they want all of these options, but realistically they might be more satisfied if we just provide them a few big buckets to work with. <laughs> And they do it well. Right. So yeah. her point was that's why there are only ever two options at Disneyland. <laughs> and Disney's the happiest place on earth, right? <laughs> but it's also like uh, we talk about the, you know, the guided pathway system, our GPS. Well, you go to your GPS actual GPS on your phone or whatever, and you want to go from point A to point B, it's not going to give you all of the different possible combinations. It's going to give you, what, three or maybe four, but three, because uh, you, you don't want to have that choice paralysis. Really, what would be the absolute best way? Well, let's, I mean, we provide the clarity. Here's the path that, it would that you would take to get from point A to point B, entering college to getting your, your degree or transferring on. Um, and giving you some, some options with that. But we just don't want to bewilder you with the 200-some different choices because, yeah, students are going to pick the, the accounting. Whatever's in the A, whatever, I'm just going to pick it. And, and some do. Just 
pick at random, okay. Because we can change our majors later on, not realizing all the consequences of doing that. So clarifying the path, I'll let Nick sort of go over this specifically related to our meta majors that I talked about earlier. Okay, yes, with, uh, with and I think, do you have another one to focus on, the, mm -hmm. the meta majors? Okay. Um, and I'll talk also a bit about, you know, the work that I did, you know, in the STEM field, so a little practical application of that. So we do have uh, 10 different uh, meta majors at, at BC. We looked at all of our uh, different uh, programs, um, and we found the different uh, commonalities. It probably took us two or three different uh, professional development institutes to really sort of you know really hone in on particular meta majors, um, and it was the faculty getting t together to decide what well, these these things look. They, they, they go together. Um, certainly, you know, STEM and the health sciences, that's pretty straightforward. But say with the different arts and humanities, that's a little bit, that's a little bit fuzzier. So how do we break these, uh, divide these different groups up? Um, and it has been a process uh, where we have uh, had these different institutes like, okay, here's, our, here's our first iteration, what do you think? And then we look at it again with even maybe a larger group of, of faculty getting engaged with it and, and fine tuning that. So uh, these are some examples then that uh, we have here. I don't know if we have the whole list, but yeah, this bis is first business group. and communication. And so um, you know, accounting, uh, say economics, uh, communication would be in there. Agriculture is one of our meta majors. Certainly for Kern County, we've got a lot of the students involved in that. So ag, business, forestry, plant science would be some examples of that. Health sciences, registered nursing, vocational nursing, sort of all out, allied health uh, with that. And STEM uh, would be you know, the area that I'm in. Um, this uh, also uh, lists the different department chairs that are, so there's a lot of text <laughs> that you see there. Um, and with the, with the meta majors, you know, grouping your programs together, Again, looking, what's the end goal that you have in mind? Either transferring on um, or getting a, a, a job with that associate's degree or, or certificate. But even if you're getting a, a bachelor's, okay, what could you do with a bachelor's degree? So uh, that's, you know, this thing here. And we are in, you know, in the process, it would continue of uh, fine tuning, you know, what can you do with a college degree in Kern County? Because we know most of the, the students are, are going to stay there you know, in, in Kern County. Some will, will move out. But again, it's providing that, that clarity for them. What can you do with a college degree? And is it worth it then um, for you to, to, to transfer on? Question there, yes. So the question is about career exploration and career pathways. Because we talk a lot about education is not in, but it's in a lot of these goals of career pathways. a good question about career planning what role does that play in coordination maybe with ed planning and if I go back to this you'll see that we listed dual enrollment as the top bullet here um, not only discipline specific dual enrollment but we actually have a career choices course in every single feeder high school in the ninth grade so that career choices course is run through our um, counseling department and the men quals for that for our, um, at BC, almost every teacher meet, meets that men qual um, for the student development one or whatever it is. So it's been really easy for us to implement. The impact has been on the department chair and the evaluations, but that's a different conversation. Um, and so that's a big part of our push for that. We haven't seen those students get to our institution yet because it just started about a year ago. Um, but we have 41 feeder high schools. So that's a, that's a lot <laughs> of courses um, out there. There are over 100 sections of it. So we're really hoping to see some payoff with that. But then the discipline-specific dual enrollment. I don't know if you all have uh, a big dual enrollment push, but we've got, what, 2,500 students or so in dual, duly enrolled, yeah, right. something like that. But it grew from about 15 sections of CTE courses maybe two years ago to... 200 sections 
of everything from career choices through um, you know, your history course or your English course. And we know that when students take a course in their maybe intended field of study, they gain a lot of clarity about whether or not that's a good fit. So doing that in high school before you're paying for it and can get hurt really is a helpful thing. I know I thought I was going to be a biology major and then I took plant biology and I was like, I don't care about mitochondria. So that really helped me figure out <laughs> that um, that wasn't a good fit for me. You asked about a career center as well, right? Um, we, we don't have a career center. Our goal is to integrate career counseling in the everyday job of every counselor. So we used our SSSP funding to uh, bring in the, um, I was a career counselor, so I should remember these, not just the MBTI, but the Holland's Personality Codes Training Strong, there you go, strong interest inventory. Um, and we got all of our counselors and ed advisors certified to facilitate that. So now it's a part of all of their student development courses, but that way we don't limit the career conversation to a place where you just go over there, but it's a part of all of the educational planning conversations as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's the dual enrollment piece, yeah. 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 By the way, his question was, do we use get focused, stay focused? She's really good. Repeated. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the camera there. Other questions about clarity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's, so this is a first iteration and it's not real beautiful, but you kind of get the, the concept mapping that we were doing here. This is where we are with our learning and career pathways. Um, and these are the meta majors, which I'll let him talk about, and then I'll talk a little bit about affinity groups. Okay, yeah, so uh, pretty, small, well, huh? you're not expected to read all the little <laughs> things here, but if you can count the red pieces there, you can see we, got, we have 10, uh, 10 meta majors uh, with that, including uh, personal and career exploration, <laughs> that uh, piece there. So that's for the truly, the truly undecided uh, students. Uh, have that uh, as well. And this, uh, um, to get to this point, it took uh, two or three different uh, professional development institutes and faculty just really figuring out, you know, how do we want to break everything on up? Um, so it's been an iterative process. But again, with this, uh, you know, grouping them together by uh, common uh, courses that they would be taking. So if they land in this, then they aren't going to be burning through their financial aid. Um, and with each, uh, with each of the, the meta majors identifying what, well, what jobs can you get with that? Whether it is an associate degree or a bachelor's degree. So it's, you know, it's again always the end goal in mind is eventually, hopefully they're gonna get a job. <laughs> Um, so the question is about where did students come into play in developing our meta majors? Um, and as a part of our participation in the AACC Pathways Project, they actually gave us some focus group protocol. Um, and we conducted focus groups with students and we did student panels, which we'll talk about later, um, of the Redesigning America's Community College book. We had them read it and then we sat in and listened. And what we heard from them largely is that they do want a level of flexibility that they want to be able to move a bit about. They really didn't want us to say, here's your major and you're locked into it, even though that's maybe what AACC kind of had recommended in the books, really lock them in, let's get them you know, on that path. Um, so we took that into consideration. They also had no idea what we were talking about when we talked about meta majors. They, they were like, what is that word? So we've been using it with you all, but you'll see we call them learning and career pathways. So again, the integration of learning and career is present for them, but we, we vetted that name through our student focus groups to make sure that it was something that would make sense to them um, and how they wanted to see it. And then we had them uh, look at our catalog and kind of inform how we might organize this in the catalog, because this is a nice flyer, but this probably isn't as student facing as something like the, the catalog. So that's another area where they've come into play. And then at all of these professional development institutes, we've been really intentional about bringing in either a panel of students 
we're having them sit at the tables with us and doing our best not to just bring in SGA over and over again. Um, but in particular, our um, act dev students, our remedial students coming in to talk about their experience because 80% are not college ready in addition to 80% being uh, remedial. Yeah, so I remember in our, our uh, different institutes of having the students come in, it's like, well, okay, here's, here's what we have, what do you think? And if you were to have, uh, you know, we, we talk about allied, say allied health, what, what does that mean for you? And, and, and then here's some suggestions that we have, and what do you think? So, yeah, we've, we've tried to involve them uh, throughout. And our uh, focus group information is actually on our website, and I can try to get that to Brian to get to you. Um, having the protocol was helpful. I don't know how large of a research department you have, if at all. We only had a district entity for a long time. Um, so we didn't really have that much capacity or knowledge to, to make that happen. So they gave us that information, which was really useful. Again, we joined because we needed help. <laughs> Leslie? Mm -hmm. Um, do you mean that in any different way than part of 3SD? And then how do you implement that? Is that done as group activities? Is that done with the kids on their own? Or is that done one-on-one? -on -one? Good question. So about the abbreviated ed plan when we deliver it, the um, career choices course I talked about, they all do an abbreviated ed plan in that course as a requirement. But it, it really goes nowhere, they're in ninth grade, so we don't really track that information, but it's getting them thinking about it. Um, but when I talk about getting students on the path, I'll kind of walk through our process of getting the ed plans through um, SSSP into the high school, and I think we were out there over 8,000 contacts um, yeah. last spring. So it's a big part of our push to clarify what the students need to do in that first semester. Not in the career choices class. Not in the career choices, but then when they do the first one, is that done on the ground with you? When they are in their senior year of high school, that's definitely tracked for SSSP and you do it as a matriculating on your campus. at the high school. Yeah. So yeah, the Renegade Roadmap has been this sort of, you know, thing we've been playing with the GPS and roads and pathways and on ramps and detours and mileposts and we're trying it's to create California. a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of those. I think there's an SNL skit about all of those highways or something. <laughs> um, so it's something we're trying to get, you know, to catch on for students. Again, it's something they they kind of latched on to, so we're trying to run with that. Yeah, we have a big, a, a really big high school outreach program going on now. Um, and so, yeah, we'll have the counselors and uh, ed advisors and uh, other folks going on out to the, the campuses to uh, different uh, high schools to uh, um, do the, the placement exams uh, there, uh, looking at their transcripts. We do multiple measures uh, as well, and then getting that uh, first uh, that student ed plan uh, there so we can get them enrolled uh, in it. Um, so it's it, it's happening there, you know, at the high schools because it's in a it's a well for the high school students it seems like a safer, more comfortable environment for them. Okay. So we have our meta majors. There was a question about affinity groups, which I want to address when we talk about staying on the path. Um, so I'll come back to that piece. You want to talk about your document here? Um, we were talking about meta majors. We have these big groupings, but what Nick has done with this document is really drill down into the STEM meta major, which is the area he's in. So we wanted to give you this example, and we actually um, will provide this on the, the drive that you have just so you can see what it looks like more in depth. It's a giant document, and I'll let him walk you through. All right, so this is uh, an Excel spreadsheet I put together as an example for our Winter Institute. Uh, we had, uh, you know, well, last January. Uh, to give folks uh, an idea, the, the different uh, faculty, an idea of, well, these are the type of things that you would need to, to do for your, for your meta major. So uh, I'm 
I'm just going to go ahead and show you this. Uh, and again, this is a spreadsheet. There's, it's several windows <laughs> <laughs> wide and long and, and all that. But uh, what I did was I looked at our, uh, um, our education plans that uh, had been uh, created two, two or three years ago or maybe a little bit longer ago for that as part of the, you know, the SSSP uh, stuff, uh, all the educational plans. And I, I looked at that for our, the programs that are in the STEM uh, area. And I looked for the commonalities uh, then for all of that. And if there was a course that was uh, uh, shown a, a lot in all of those different uh, education plans, then you know, I put that at the top and you know, color coded it here. So for the STEM meta major then, uh, um, you know, for, for biology, there, we have the I get see you track for that. Um, there's the chemistry. Uh, Okay, I have to take off my glasses and <laughs> go back and forth here with this. Uh, computer science, uh, there are two different tracks that we, two different education plans that we had for that. The CSU and the IGETC engineering, um, uh, geology, and two, again, two different tracks uh, for that. Uh, the, the math degree, uh, two different tracks for that, physics. So uh, these were the, uh, the ones that are in our uh, uh, meta major, actual uh, uh, associate uh, degrees for that, and um, found, well, everybody needs to take them, our math B6A. All right, so, uh, um, and then, oops, oh, go, went the wrong way, this way here, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Uh, if there are other, that other gen ed courses that are, were explicitly mentioned, in this case I chose six, you know, six or more times. I have that uh, here as well. Um, so let me go on down a bit further and move it on over. Oh, there we go. Um, so, uh, and then I, to help me look, make sense of all this, I tried to color code then those common things there so it was easy to, to visualize. Uh, did that for the first, second, and then the third semester and, and fourth semester. So you get this idea of, uh, grouping together these courses that we know our students are going to have to, to take. So if they decide to, they want to move a bit in, the, in that meta major, they aren't uh, burning through financial aid. So that was the, the impetus behind uh, that. Um, and oops, can we go a little bit further on down here? All right, uh, careers. What can you do with uh, an associate degree uh, in biology or in chemistry or whatever? Um, and if there's uh, realistically, you know, associate degree, you, you, you can't get a job, uh, say, with a physics AA. I mean, that's really intended to get a at least a bachelor's degree. So we identify that. Again, it's just really clarifying for the students. What can you do with this particular degree? What, what sort of career are you eventually looking at? And um, then, uh, well, and what's the pay uh, for it? Possible... Uh, then I also had looked at, and I, does it come up here? Yeah, I stole this from someplace else, <laughs> all of this, so I'm not accused of plagiarizing there. So, uh, um, but what can you do with that particular uh, degree? And this, again, this is an example. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, at the associate's level, it really is a jumping off point to a lot of uh, possibilities there. So, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the fields or uh, rows that I have uh, for this. Uh, what's the other? So you have career choices, and then I also, uh, you're looking at, well, what are the particular skills that you acquire uh, with this uh, major? What can you do, uh, maybe not a particular career, but uh, what the general skills that you need? And that's what you need to have as part of the pathways. Of uh, you know of clarifying well these are the, the type of skills you are going to pick up along the way to your to your final destination. Um, it's just really laying it all out there for for the students, um, and a lot of, there's a lot of uh, overlap of course uh, for for these. All right, so that was that's my little uh, particular <laughs> example of a, a drill down uh, for that. Um, we are still in the process of then, uh, um, for some of the other uh, general education classes that are outside of, of STEM, so uh, uh, if, uh, different psychology or different arts, uh, one, really what ones would be good 
for that. And maybe it's still, well, you can take really any of the, any of the arts would be fine. Um, we found as part of doing this, I uh, found that you know, some of the, the majors said that you had to take this particular arts class. Well, that's because the counselor that worked with that particular group of faculty for that program was saying you had to have a p particular class, and that may be because there was some limitation with, I don't know, maybe with degree works or, or some other software that they were using. It's like you, you have to choose a particular class rather than an area. You know, I, I don't know what the, the, and so we looked at it and said, well, really, do you have to have that particular class? So this is, is helping us uh, make the, uh, well, really start the conversations of really what gen ed classes do you need for that particular d degree? Um, you know, if any of them work, well, we need to let uh, you know the students know that. So that that was that was helpful uh, for us um, in sort of identifying uh, some of those uh, areas. And well, yeah, it turns out at least you know for the different arts and humanities, yeah, you just take the whole big wide uh, uh, swath of ones. Any of those w would work. And there are some others though that are really more particular. Yeah, if you have this one, you will do a lot better. You know, in, say with a, a physics major later on down the road there. If I could point something out here on this column here, you'll notice that that bright green strip that said Math B6A. Every single student who wants to pursue um, a degree within the STEM major is going to need Math 6A. So the recommendation is that first semester, every single student take this course, right? Because you can't get off path if you're in the course that is going to be required across the board. And it gives you that room for movement without getting hurt in the long run. So that's a place where we're trying to build in the sequence as a part of the exploration. So that early on, they've got a little bit of room to grow. And if we could zoom out in a, a, a much larger screen, um, or if you can dig in and look at it, you'll see that some of this color coding um, helps you identify where is a student um, taking a particular course and in, which, and in which point in time um, should they take it so that they don't get hurt either with financial aid or just in their time to completion. Another area is that you'll see we've, we've kept um, gen ed area whatever. Um, you probably heard Rob Johnstone talk about the battle of narrowing down a particular gen ed for every single degree. Um, we have at BC called that nirvana. <laughs> um, our president has coined that as nirvana. And really that's not a, an area that we're trying or wanting to tackle at this point in time. It's a very, very complex problem to solve, not only in terms of, of ed planning, but in enrollment management and faculty loads and all of those sorts of things that it doesn't have the biggest bang for its buck in our journey toward guided pathways. So we're talking about clarity. If we can explain the gen ed pattern and give a recommendation, great. But there's not this requirement that is you're going to take you know, small group communication instead of public speaking or, or whatever if it's not really required by the transfer institution or gen ed. Does that make sense? Was that a question that maybe somebody wrote down? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. As Leslie said, ideally, it would be uh, great to identify those particular, uh, maybe the gen ed courses that would be uh, um, critical for their eventual career. Um, and but it's also really controversial. <laughs> uh, complex probably would be a good way to. You know, maybe that's more a euphemism for it's it's controversial because uh, you know. <laughs> Well, what if we have students taking you know more of these classes than what happens to enrollment in my pet uh, class? You know, so th we are still in the process of, of doing that, and we realize that's going to be uh, a lot of touchy stuff <laughs> with it. Um, but uh, at least you know identifying it right now is the first step to you know solving the problem. Questions about that in the back. So this, yeah, well, these, these are the, the, the question was, uh, um, can, like this, they, can they really get out in the two years? Well, 
yes, if they are college, if they are college prepared, you know, if they if they can mm -hmm. take math yeah. in that uh, yeah. that first semester, then yeah, we have it all laid out for them. So what happens if they don't? Um, and for our students, uh, was it 70, 75 percent? Definitely are they're not at the, at this level yet. So we're also then building in then the the part of uh, well the, the remediation sequence for the math. I mean that's really a, a big one here. We've also identified the English as well. So yeah, this particular one here is for getting out in the four semesters. Yeah, lots of disclaimers here. So um, when we talk about our college promise and we say that it is a promise that you can complete your degree in two years, that's if you're college ready, if you take advantage of the priority registration that we give you, if you enroll in the courses that we put on your ed plan. It's all of those if you follow all of the, you know, you take advantage of the tools we're giving you. Um, so that's the clarity, is you've got skin in the game. This is a shared responsibility. We will give you the tools that you need to be successful, but you've got to show up and do it. And so we're working on our second iteration of our promise, which is maybe a couple of years out, for students who come in requiring remedial coursework. And that will be a three-year promise, probably, um, because the reality is, and the clarity we need to give them, is that they will not be there for two years if they come in requiring two courses of remedial math to get to not just college ready, but maybe transfer ready, which are sometimes different things, right? Other questions? Mm -hmm. We are uh, not allowed to teach any remedial courses in the high school. So that's a requirement. Um, I don't know if that's a state requirement or a district requirement for us, but we can't teach any remedial courses. So all we can really do is provide, you know, like those jump starts and tutoring and prep for um, assessment tests and things like that. But we cannot reach down with a, you know, because technically the high school should be teaching that according to the legislation. So the question, could they come in as like a concurrent student to take a remedial course? I actually don't know the answer to that. So maybe, it, but is, do you all also have the requirement that you cannot teach a remedial course in the high school? Okay, so it might be a district requirement for us. Um, and if, it, if we have that first requirement, I'm guessing the second one is there. I'm not sure on that. But I also don't know how much value there is in that for the student. <laughs> in getting those units and paying for that if they're coming to us versus us going to them. So you guys have that coordination there. That's awesome. That's great. Another question in the back? Okay. So it sounds like at Moore Park, you all are able to reach down with some of that for students who maybe aren't getting the AP courses or the A's and B's and identify who they are and try and bring them up. That's fantastic. And so when I talked about earlier instruction in student affairs as being, you know, these critical, this critical integration, you can't ignore business services and um, policies at your district level or at the legislative level. So if we're seeing that these are major issues that we need to address, that's on us to challenge, but we have to challenge it with the right kind of data um, that shows that there could be an impact in our, our students' lives if we don't. Another thing I wanted to, to mention with this is that uh, this also identifies uh, for us what are the definitely the courses um, we need to have more sections in. Um, at, uh, well, certainly at, at Bakersfield College, one of the, the big problems of you know, e even implementing our promise for is getting the classes uh, there in, uh, and having it all in, in sequence. Um, we can get it in sequence, but do we have enough of those courses? We know, like, well, for this one, Math 6A, we have to have a, a lot more student, a lot more sections available. Uh, we do have uh, students that, you know, if they they can't get in, even being on the wait list, okay, well, that's going to bump them back another year, 
of, of having to wait. And so we, we've, uh, we're in the process, uh, continued process of identifying the bottlenecks you know, in our system. Question in the back. Mm-hmm. Enrollment management is a big part of this. Um, and for us, our enrollment management team, I think, largely was just instructional folks. And now I, I'm a member of the student affairs team, and I definitely talk about enrollment management at every meeting that I'm in. Um, because it is, it's a huge part of students' ability to get through on time. If they can't get into a class and that puts them a year out, I mean, of course we're setting them up to fail. So much life happens in a year, um, and they're not getting what they need. They're going to either go somewhere else to get what they need, or they're going to go get a job. Um, so that's, you know, that's on us for sure. Yeah, so we were definitely finding that, uh, you know, uh, students dropping out just due to the frustration, that, you know, in our system. Um, so that's been helpful. Uh, this whole process of developing it has uh, really been helpful for us to identify those, uh, those breakdowns in, in the system. One more question. Yeah, that's a good question. So is there a student-facing version of that document, which was definitely meant for our internal work? Um, I would say some of that is the catalog in reality, right, is that you sequence things in a catalog rather than here's the whole big jumble of things that you need to take at some point in time. Um, our nursing program has always done that. They say in the first semester you take this, second semester you take this, and so on. Um, but we haven't gotten there to grouping that as a meta major in our catalog, but we're we've definitely changed the structure of how we list things in uh, programs of study. Okay, I'm gonna move on so we can get through these four pillars. Um, so does this look like maybe what the process is for a student to get to campus um, to onboard to their academic program of study? And I don't know if we have financial aid folks in the room, but it's route I-666 for the financial <laughs> aid department. Um, and when I saw this, so jokingly, I love my, we have a fantastic financial aid director um, who's very passionate, but to a student, this is what it feels like, right? Um, and when we went to our very first institute at the AACC Pathways Project, they asked us to do an activity I really loved as, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with MBTI, but I'm kind of an ideas person. Um, what would your guided pathways look like if you drew it? And so we got to kind of play around with that idea, and we came up with a pinball machine. <laughs> so uh, the pinball machine would shoot the student up through whatever on-ramping process that we have, and then when they fall through um, down, they don't just drop into nowhere. <laughs> right, that there are levers that get them where they need to go. Um, so trying to kind of clean up those pathways so there isn't that big jumble and on-ramp to the college. Um, so our, our getting the students on the path um, work really has revolved a lot, or I think has maybe been galvanized by our SSSP money. Um, early and frequent engagement, our matriculation steps in every single high school, we do a lot of one-day registration events and really expanding our online services, but I think the single best thing that we do for students is our summer bridge um, and setting them up for success, and I think our data really shows that. So we looked at our onboarding process and tried to develop a flow chart, and not just what do we want it to look like, but realistically, what is the intake process for every single student at scale? And if it's not at scale, why isn't it at scale, and how can we get it there? Um, for example, Summer Bridge is not at scale. Not every single student comes in. So what are the steps that we need to take to get it there? And slowly but surely implementing those things. So we started our intake process with interest and recruitment. So the process begins long before they get there, and this interest in recruitment needs to begin before the high school experience, right? We're not just targeting... Um, students in the 12th grade who thought, maybe I'll go to college next year. It's trying to build a college-going culture. And then we used this um, kind of secondary area here to kind of group out what that looks like so that we have a sense of 
what is the work happening across the campus. So we have things that uh, you know everyone knows about our Kern County College night, like 30,000 students come through it, it's a huge deal. And then we have our planetarium visits, which is an activity that Nick leads. That's a huge part of his work to get students interested in the campus, interested in astronomy, um, that kind of thing. We walked all the way from the application, orientation, um, assessment, multiple measures, ed planning, registration. Those are things that you all do. But do you do them at scale for every single student? And if not, how could you get there? Um, but then we incorporated what happens after registration, because getting them onto their academic pathway doesn't stop just once they've registered for classes and now we have them. Um, so we even work in here that they need to pay or they're going to be dropped. Um, we did work in Summer Bridge. So if our goal is to uh, have a very specific flow for every single student entering campus, we needed to figure out where Bridge would fit. So we did uh, detail here that it's optional, but we're going toward an opt-out <laughs> process. Um, we talked about the way that we keep them enrolled in their first term. Comprehensive ed planning. So you can't on-ramp a student successfully without really looking at the comprehensive picture. Their update form. I don't know about you, but we have this really silly form in the system that prevents them from registering for the second term if they don't complete this form. The counselors are shaking their heads. Yeah. Ours is not that simple. <laughs> um, and students don't know to do it, and it holds up their registration. So if that is something they have to do, and it's something that we can't remove as a barrier, then we need to let them know that they have to do that. And we need to build that into the process. Is that somehow connected to the comprehensive term? Is that like saying, yes, you've done the comprehensive term, so you can move on to the next term? That is the goal, okay. right, is to create a system where when they do their comprehensive ed plan, they do their update form so that they can register for the next term, right? That everything is linked together and sequential so the student knows exactly where in the process to go next, no questions asked. Is it summer bridge, is it a four credit or like a non-credit type? It's a half a unit and it is curriculum run out of our academic development department. We do some bridges in the high school, um, so for it's part of our equity um, work and we don't attach a unit because we can't teach remedial courses. Yeah, in the, in the summer bridge, uh, we include you know, how to do college or what's the difference between high school and, and college. And certainly you know, for our students, they really need to see the, the stark differences uh, between that. Um, and then also each of the, the students um, during that summer bridge day, they will be able to meet with a counselor which is, you know, that, that's gold. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to do that. But they have a lot harder time if they didn't go through the summer bridge just because, you know, the number of students we have, uh, the, the counselor to student, the student counselor ratio that we have. Um, but uh, that's, that's another little, I guess, uh, incentive that we give them. It's like you, you, you attend summer bridge, you will definitely have your schedule set for, for fall. And we know that it really is what you want to take. Yeah, it's students. Mm -hmm. um, so I talked earlier about how we are in every single high school, um, and that's been an iterative process. We didn't immediately jump into all 41 high schools. Um, we had to, to build our team, but it's really been mostly a reworking of the way that we do things. So we didn't hire you know, 40 new counselors and assign them each to a high school, we had to figure out how do we work this into their day to day. And so we've, um, we've created an outreach and school relations department and they kind of take the programmatic lead on getting us into the high schools. But the counseling department, which is made up of counselors and ed advisors, which is a complicated concept to some folks, um, they are the ones leading most of the work in the high schools. But we're also trying to empower the high school staff to deliver some of this on our behalf. So we train them to deliver the assessment test, to be proctors, and you'll see that we have just exponentially scaled this in three years' time. And the reason that I include this as being an important part of the getting students on the path pillar 
is that all of this work is really correlated to completion. So individually, any single matriculation step has a positive correlation. But when they're fully matriculated, it's huge. And the number of students fully matriculated is massively increasing. So yes, it's money that came in one pocket from the legislators, but it's really translating. So how can we make sure that that is sustainable and institutionalized? So back to our bridge. Um, our bridge started out, like Nick said, with like 30 to 50 students, and I think it was like a full week at one point. Mm -hmm. And we have been through a lot of different versions of bridge. Um, and we'll go through our timeline pretty quickly, but it's it started, I think, in 2012, 2013, 2013. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. With just a small pocket, just as somebody's kind of side pet project. They did their dissertation in um, mind, growth mindset and understanding first-gen students. So it was this thing that she was really excited about, and she got a group of students and made it happen. And over time, we saw that that was really working and scaled it from, you know, 30 to 50 up to, you know, I think it was like 300 and then 500 the next summer. And last summer, we got about 600 students, and this year we got 1,500. So we're making these major strides fairly quickly, but it's also become this massive engagement strategy. So every single new faculty member, when they're hired, um, our president says, and what, what day of bridge are you going to sign up for? Um, because they participate and they sit with the students at the tables so that they're not just left to kind of, you know, hang out and like maybe tune in to the actual teacher of the bridge. But that person sits with them and they're learning about the support services and learning about what students experience and hearing their fears and hearing their insecurities with the student. So it's about a culture change, right? Um, and we're getting faculty who have been at BC for 30 years to come and do that. I think our longest tenured faculty member, 41 years, was at a bridge last week. Um, so it, it is the way that we're getting the, the culture to kind of move toward the idea that we're responsible for the whole student. So for us, bridge is a fantastic thing for students, but it's equally fantastic for our faculty and staff. Oh, yeah. We do. So we do a special compensation, and everybody who participates is paid, and we use our SSSP funding to pay for that. And it's really a drop in the bucket when you think about how that, that really impacts what they do. Yeah, I know for the faculty uh, that I've talked to, and of course also myself, it's just been uh, really helpful to get the big picture you know, of what, the, what goes on. Um, another thing we do is take a tour of the campus. and. You know, so many of us being in our little silo, I know that my little part of the campus, but all these other things that I never saw before. And so it's a really great uh, professional development uh, opportunity for our faculty uh, to do it. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, re required <laughs> for, our, for new faculty uh, yeah. to do that. An expectation that new yeah. faculty will engage them, we will pay them, and I, I think we've had a really great turnout. I mean, they're excited to learn about the campus anyway, so it's so far it's really working for us, and it's something that absolutely other colleges can can replicate in a way that works for you. It's one day, one day, um, like nine hours, <laughs> it's a long day, a long but we day. feed them, we pay the faculty, there's a lot of different interactive activities, so it's a very fun day. Um, but they they really do learn a lot, and they make friends, and they start to become acclimated. And it has and it has really iterated over the time, as, as Leslie said. Uh, I think the first ones were maybe like a week long, and then we did the three di three days, uh, like nine to twelve, and then we just we figured we found you know from the students you know talking to the students really what would be better. Get that just that one solid day, we got it all done. Knock it out, yeah. And the course success, I mean, it's massive. Um, so in the first semester after a student participates in Bridge, their success in their um, coursework, at least their completion of their coursework, I should say, is at 91%. So we're retaining these students big time <laughs> compared to a lot of our other um, interventions early on. So if you hear nothing else about Get on the Path, I think a Bridge is a really important part of that. So a stay on the path. We've talked a lot this morning um, and referenced completion coaching 
quite a bit, and this is really where it's happening for us. This has been our, our priority 100% in the past year, and I'll talk about affinity groups within this section. Um, so we have the completion coaching, academic support, um, technology, high tech and high touch. Um, I can't talk about keeping students on the path without emphasizing our institutional effectiveness, our metrics, our research that we're looking at to make sure we're there. Um, with Excel, course acceleration, um, I, uh, you all have accelerated courses in maybe your remedial areas. It's, it was kind of one of the early things, one of those early um, interventions, you might say, that, that got us thinking about student success is how can we shorten their um, experience because we know life happens and that kind of thing. And our success rates are showing that it's working for us. But with multiple measures and acceleration, it's really working for us. Um, so multiple measures being kind of a get on the path process and uh, acceleration keeping them there. We're seeing a big payoff, not only in their success, but financially. So students were saving over $1.4 million in one semester alone as a group with multiple measures and course acceleration. Um, so this for us is a strategy to keep them on the path because we know that financial um, barriers are present and that um, time is the enemy. So if we can focus on accelerating courses, getting the students who need to get through a remedial course through quickly, they're more likely to get to that college level course and be successful. I wanted to highlight this for you today. And this is something we just handed out yesterday. So I went back in and added it really late last night. Um, because for us, somebody asked about, is intrusive intervention a part of your strategy? So this is an actual student schedule. The student is a part of our current promise. Um, and you'll see, this is a, a view, I don't know if you are a banner institution. And you can see their courses, how it lines up. We actually had our IT batch pull a list of student schedules and our academic support services team went through and manually identified time slots for their academic support services. So it is listed on their schedule, not through a tech process, through a manual process right now, when they're going to go. We can't mandate it, but to a student who doesn't do optional, this kind of looks mandated, right? <laughs> so if I were looking at this, I'd be like, OK, time to go to my English Extend the Classroom session from 11.15 to 12.15, because that's when it's on my schedule. So we did that for every single student in the current promise. And the message to them is, this is your schedule, and this is how you're going to be successful. You've got to show up to these places at these times. So it might not be a co-requisite. It might not actually formally be on their schedule, but it's on their schedule. <laughs> <laughs> and for us, I mean, it was a really kind of simple thing that it took some time, but now we've got the process down. And it's a way that, that we're hoping we will see some payoff and students actually going to those academic support services. OK, Nick, you want to start us off talking about completion coaching? Yeah, this is uh, uh, something that we are, uh, OK. So we surround the, the, the student with all of these different uh, people that to, uh, to go from the really blurry uh, 30,000 uh, students, making them uh, more visible in their smaller groups. And you do that by surrounding them with uh, the different uh, people. Um, and so you know, I would be you know, a disciplined faculty, uh, an example of that. But uh, academic development faculty or a financial aid technician, uh, um, uh, the, the dean would be uh, uh, sort of getting the, you know, setting up the meetings uh, for get all these uh, folks together. Uh, have somebody that really knows uh, how to work the, um, our different uh, data. Uh, machines, uh, how uh, that is uh, you know, extracting the, the data that we have. Peer mentors, so we got, hopefully we'll get students you know, involved in, in this as well. Um, and then of course counselor, educational advisors. So uh, we are, uh, last uh, semester, so spring semester, we developed you know, the roles for all these different people. Um, well, 
the first iteration <laughs> of the roles. And, uh, and really, it's going to be this semester where we find out you know, how well it's working because that, this is, we are starting now with completion, uh, actual uh, the coaching uh, teams this fall. Um, and you know, we'll see you know, how it all works together. Uh, we plan on uh, meeting as, uh, as these completion coaching uh, groups. Uh, I'd say, uh, I'm trying to remember my schedule, I think it was like every, every two weeks. Getting, uh, getting together and we're identifying then for our say 2,000 students or 4,000 students, however big our meta major is, um, you know, looking at you know, how are these students progressing? What are the, the, the problems that we're seeing? If we identify different problems in the system, okay, well, you know, we've got some actual uh, you know, data to, to show that this is a problem. And so then what would we need to do to, to fix that? And that's, of course, having the you know, the, the deans uh, involved in that gets, you know, the administration, you know, uh, uh, aware of, of those. Um, so oh, this okay, is a you really the, quick the look. Yeah. Some of the responsibilities. Um, well, this is a, yeah, uh, that's really. More Nick's version and my version. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, my version actually would have uh, more birds in there, too, so. <laughs> But anyway, you get an idea of uh, what's all happening with uh, the different uh, students. And out in the academic development faculty uh, helps with the remediation component, particularly in the STEM area, where we know that math is going to be a, a big problem for them. Um, how do we uh, uh, get them you know, quickly on up to what, what they need for the calculus? So by breaking these groups down and surrounding them by a team of experts, it prevents me from having to be an expert in everything. I don't know everything about financial aid. Um, the financial aid contact can know everything about financial aid, and now I have somebody who I can connect with. So we're surrounding the student with a team of people who cares about them and their, their allies. So yesterday we had our big Kern Promise orientation day. Um, welcome to those students. And when Sonia, our president, gave her introduction, she said, I want you to call me Coach Sonia. <laughs> so she is a completion coach in our completion coaching community for the Kern Promise. So it's really a, she would say, a cloak that we are wearing, um, that we are all responsible for completion, no matter our role on campus. A&R, <laughs> financial aid, the library, the academic development department, it's that cross-functional look at a student's experience and surrounding them. So, and, and having these, um, you know, these different experts, say with a counselor, uh, ed advisor, you know, for, for the STEM area, uh, they would know really the requirements and they would be able to specialize uh, in that. What do the students eventually need to, to get? And certainly with the, with the financial aid expert, you know, you know, as a discipline faculty, I have no idea what all goes into that. But I, but I know who they could talk to, you know, and I'd be able to hand that off uh, to them. So, and if the financial aid expert, uh, you know, the student has a question for them uh, that, you know, is dealing really with, say, the astronomy classes. Well, they know, okay, you got to go talk to Strobel, you know, so, so they would know. And being able to hand off from one, one person to the next. So an example of how we started to organize this, because it's a very big concept that took us a long time to get our arms around it. So we created a giant, another giant Excel spreadsheet. We're fans of doing that. Um, with each of these key criteria and started to populate it. Now it's in a Google document, so we're constantly updating it. Because the challenge when you're using people's names is that that obviously changes. So we have our Dean of Counseling who is directly <laughs> responsible for maintaining this. And you'll see that we've populated it not only with the people who are playing this role, but with the number of students they're responsible for. So I mentioned we have 30,000 students. Well, 1,800 is a much more uh, reasonable number to feel like, okay, these are mine. <laughs> these are my babies, and I need to make sure that they get through. I have a responsibility for that. So I did include in my um, flash drive for you that document. So you can see what it looks like across the board for all of our meta majors. So we have that broken down, 1,500 in ag, 1,800 in arts and humanities, and they're of varying sizes, right? So that's how we're kind of starting to map this out in our first semester of really getting this moving. Um, and then in those 
roles, um, an example of how that looks actually worked with our affinity groups, which I want to talk about in just a minute, um, with the Kern Promise as one of our affinity groups. And at our first completion coaching team meeting at our affinity group, um, the Kern Promise, our financial aid director came with a list of our Kern Promise students and said, all of these students are missing a FAFSA on file able to pinpoint the exact names. And then we were able to say, these 72 people, you need to come in and make an appointment. Or better yet, at your orientation day, we're going to walk you over to financial aid and you're gonna sit there and you're gonna get your FAFSA complete. Um, so we have a better sense of how to kind of chunk out the work based on how whatever angle we're approaching <laughs> it, right? Um, then our counselor said, these you know, 140 students, their schedules are solid. But these 60, there's some issues. And she was able to pinpoint exactly the issue for every one of those students. So we have this cohort report that becomes this manageable document when you have a team of people looking at it. Carrie, the counselor for Kern Promise, doesn't need to know everything about the student's financial aid. She just needs to know how to get them there. So it's, it's helping to distribute the work and engage people across campus. Uh huh. What did you enroll for fall? In April. Mm -hmm. Do you all do spring? <laughs> Type the question and answer. <laughs> Do you do it like July? When does Moore Park enroll for? We don't know. Too late. Yeah, June, July. Okay. Yes, I think there's. It's a you know there are pros and cons to each, but it does afford us the time to really start to look at who's coming in to see us in the fall and to develop a strategy around that. The reverse. The reverse is that many students don't know they can register for fall in April, so that's a challenge. I was, I was wondering that, and then how do your freshmen or your first-time students coming out of your high school, are you, when are you in their high school? Starting how, in September. So you start in <laughs> September, work your way around. Work all the way they until April. Around, they're ready with, they, they have that first semester at the end and all of that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I don't have much time, but I want to run through the affinity groups because I think it's a critical part of this. When we talk about guided pathways, um, one of the things that I think is unsaid is that this is something that helps students universally. Um, but what happens to all of those unique interventions that we've developed that support students with very specific needs? And this is what we've developed in our equity planning. We've got all of these what some might call boutique programs that serve 15 to 30 students that are fantastic, but they don't scale necessarily. Um, so we're trying to move away from that while maintaining some where we see are necessary. And so we've identified eight affinity groups that we believe need a completion team around them based on either an equity indicator or something that we're tracking or some other piece of the experience that we know complicates kind of how they're going to navigate the campus. So in addition to the 10 meta majors, there are eight affinity groups that also have a small but mighty completion team around them. So they are our African American students, our dreamers, our veterans, foster youth, this is a test for me, Athlete. um, athletes, our DSPS, EOPNS Care and CalWORKs and our Kern Promise. So those smaller groups require specific interventions and it's a way for us to keep equity at the forefront <laughs> of the Guided Pathways framework. I got it. Yeah, I better get it, I'm in charge of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still taking shape. Um, and so for now, we're going to continue to track both of those groups. Eventually maybe they'll fold right in and we'll have you know, some kind of contact on every completion team for that affinity group. But right now we feel like there's so much work to be done to support those students that we want to give them specialized attention. So I supervise uh, Julian West, who's an ed advisor in my area. He serves a cohort 
of 700 African American students, and those are his babies. <laughs> and he he watches out for them in every way, shape, or form. And he's got a team that he gets them to where they need to go. So we're giving them a contact. And I can tell you just from having, you know, I sit in the same office space. Um, you see students who I don't think have ever come in to talk to anybody because Julian's their guy. <laughs> Good question. What's an ed advisor? So we have counselors, counseling faculty. We also have ed advisors who are classified staff. Um, they do very similar work. So this is a little bit of a loaded question. Um, they really, the only thing that they don't do is teach courses. They do work a 12 month schedule and our counselors are on a 10 month schedule. Um, and our counselors are on a 33 hour student contact schedule and they're on a 40. So there's some differences in their availability that makes it a really useful option for us to pursue. There also is a difference in min quals. So they do they only need a bachelor's degree. Most do have master's degrees. Um, but it broadens you know, who can come in and support those students. So Julian, for example, I, I couldn't think of somebody better to, to be in this role. And he doesn't meet men quals for a counseling position. He has an MBA. So he's kind of got this like sales background and gets people in. He's just like, you're coming through the door and you're seeing me. That really works. Um, so it does broaden how, you know, how we can reach students. But it's definitely a conversation on our campus. Okay, I'm going to hop out of here and get back to the, the presentation because we only have a few minutes left. I want to talk about these momentum points. Um, your president asked, how do you know if you've been successful? And um, our president at every single meeting this entire summer has said, there are four things I want to track. <laughs> and if you can't answer these questions about your cohort, your group of students, then we've got a problem. How are they doing in enrolling in college level English and math in their first year? Are they getting to 15 units by the end of the fall term, 30 by the end of the spring term, and in their second year, have they reached 60? That's how we know. Are they getting through in a timely manner? Are they getting to college level quickly? And if we can track those things and we can identify how we're doing in that and are we making movement there, I think we have a good sense of how we're doing with our Guided Pathways implementation. So this is, these are the first kind of four metrics that we are tracking for BC that I would encourage you all to develop metrics that make sense for you. So I don't have the data on this. I could tell you how our students are doing in these areas, but I can't tell you how our work is influencing that yet. Make sense? I see some heads nodding. Okay. And ensuring learning is pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> Well, oh yeah, it's just assessment. <laughs> yeah. Just assessment. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, um, in, in, in assessing, you know, down really, you know, at, at, at the student level is really what to eventually want to be able to, to get to. Um, so yeah, how do we know that they are learning? Um, and then that, of course, it, you want to make sure all your your course slows and your program uh, learning outcomes are, are measurable. You know, clear and measurable uh, to do that. So that's, uh, um, and it also then requires you know a good uh, technology system to, to gather all that uh, stuff uh, together. Um, we have uh, for us, it's eLumen, I think is yeah, is the software package that you know we're going to be using to, to get all that, um, and we're just getting that in. Mm -hmm. uh, we we were you know with Curriculumet and which is definitely an evil term in our campus. Um, Co-curricular, then different uh, learning experiences for in student clubs uh, would be some examples of, of that. Um, our president kind of likes to say we, we're in the business of ensuring learning, so we hope that we're doing pretty well on this, but it does require <laughs> continual you know, monitoring and revisiting um, and really trying to, eventually we want to move to a greater focus on these co-curricular learning experiences and how do we fold those in to the pathway experience beyond something like a summer bridge. But our director of student life serves on a completion coaching community. So he'll start to kind of help us understand better what that could look like. So we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to fly through this piece of it because we talked about what we're doing, but we didn't talk about how we got there. 
Um, and some of this you can go back and reference. We have some of our implementation plans and those documents here. But this is a leadership curriculum that Aspen Institute presented to us at our leadership summit on guided pathways this past spring. And it made a lot of sense to me. And a lot of it has to do with communication and communicating a sense of urgency and a sense of shared responsibility and ownership of change across the campus. We're very fortunate at BC to have a president who is an excellent communicator and absolutely develops a sense of urgency in everyone around her. Um, in a way that has really pushed us to another level. So in the past, we were sort of working, and I wasn't there, so Nick could probably speak to this better, but um, in kind of small siloed teams and allowing our resources to drive our goals as opposed to the other way around. And we're trying to flip that on its head and move in a different direction. Yeah, system-wide system look there, I think. Mm -hmm. So this work started for us but we wouldn't have called it at the time Guided Pathways. And what we went back and looked, we think it's fall 2013, when conversations about student success started to really happen beyond how are students doing in their classes and do we have enrollment, but really how are they doing? And Nick could talk maybe about what that semester looked like. Yeah, well, we have up there the first generation movie. Uh, two of the, the students that are in that uh, movie actually are uh, we're students in our community college district, uh, Kern Community College District. Um, the different viewings of that, student panels uh, with that, it was just really eye-opening um, to, to find out, uh, you know, from their perspective, just how bewildering you know, college is, because they don't, they didn't have that uh, family history. So that uh, um, then led us to with habits of mind. It's, that was a faculty-led uh, initiative. Uh, um, you know, like, uh, well, yeah, I, well, we have seven different uh, um, pieces uh, of that. Um, Summer Bridge. Started about yeah, that time. Yeah, uh, approximately that time. Though I think uh, Kimberly might have been doing even, maybe even <laughs> before that, with, again, with the real small groups. I remember doing a planetarium show for at least one or two of the Summer Bridges several years ago, having them come on through. But uh, another thing, I guess, you know, as we do this, we show this, it's like you can see that this has been developing over a number of years, you know, for us. It's not something that we're just And I, I think for, I'm certain for you all, it's already in development. So it's going back and pinpointing where did this kind of start for us and how can we take those things that built excitement on our campus and make them bigger and greater and happen for every student. So we had some small pilots, but in fall 2015 was the, the semester that we applied for the AACC Pathways Project. And what I want you all to hear about that is whether or not you're participating in a project or not, is that creating short-term action plans and a sense of accountability is the thing that took this to the next level. So with this process, it really required us to reflect on all these things that were in the application. And we found that in these criteria that they say are really essential to implementing Guided Pathways successfully, we had to do a tough look and say, where are we really in this area? And they gave us lots of prompts and help us, helped us to think through it. Our technology was pretty low. Data collection, we, we like it, but we didn't have much capacity for it. But we had awesome leadership. We, had, we were ready for institutional change. There was a lot of momentum. So we were just in the right place at the right time for this. And that's when we, well, we were accepted to that project, again, because we needed a lot of help still. Um, but what we, we saw throughout that process is that our action planning was so regular. <laughs> and we revisited it every few months because we had to for the project. So that accountability for us was so critical in getting us to move forward. So just because you're not a part of this doesn't mean you can't create something like that on your campus, but who's going to be the person to hold you accountable? How are you going to hold yourselves accountable? How will you know you've been successful? So we took these kind of only four to five goals per institute that were manageable. And within our action plan, we had the goal. We assigned it to people and we had a follow-up plan. So we always were closing the loop constantly, and that was what really, I think, helped us in the past two years. 
So you'll see, I mean, this is just kind of getting bigger and bigger as we go um, and more complex. But I think our implementation team is the thing that if I could have started this out differently, hindsight's 2020, we would have had an implementation team day one <laughs> instead of a year and a half in. Um, you know, we were just kind of working through it and seeing what happened. You have to have a team of people who are accountable for making this work happen and also accountable for disseminating the information. So we put in um, the flash drive that we will leave you all a document not only with the implementation team charge, and I highlighted a couple of things, a central communication hub, reporting to groups they represent, suggesting and delivering professional development and implementation plans. They are the crew that kind of holds all of that together. So the representatives on the team, we have Academic Senate, CSEA, which is classified. We've got IT, professional development. We have all of the different players at the table who may be able to help us make this happen, but can also take back to their crew the information that, they, that we are developing as we go. The engagement can't happen if people don't know about it, and the two of us can't, can't, mm -hmm. can't communicate everything to the entire campus community. So this, again, is all in your um, packet there. So we develop priorities as a part of that implementation team, and that's all of the work you just heard us talk about. That's the stuff that we started tackling, and the professional development has been, I think, probably the most critical in the yeah. engagement campus-wide. So those institutes are happening um, three times a year. One the first week after class ends, one the first week before classes begin, and in the winter. So three different points we have this campus-wide professional development institute that re-engages the entire community in the conversation. And that's how we developed the meta majors, mm -hmm. completion coaching. And these institutes, they, they have grown you know, <laughs> in, in, in involvement. So. So that's, that's huge for us. And now we're heading into completion coaching, completion coaching, completion coaching, right. and those four metrics for the fall semester. And the current promise is really a way that we're trying to scale that to reach, reach all students. So that's why that's there. So we have one minute left. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to bring, to bring back to you to close out is this slide where we we introduced the criteria that AACC asked us to reflect on. Where were we as an institution? Where were we getting stuck as an institution? If we can envision where we wanted to go as an institution in these areas, what would it look like? And that really helped us figure out what's our capacity to do something like this. Are we already kind of there and we just need to organize it and streamline it a bit? Probably in a lot of areas. Um, so I hope you take comfort in that that piece of it, that you are doing so much guided pathways work already, but that putting some of these organizing frameworks into place can really help you take it to the next level. Yeah. So, <laughs> so at the beginning we gave you an index, index card with your one burning question, and there were lots more throughout, but all we want to hear from you is a yes or no. Did we answer that question for you? And then we'll collect them back. So I have to thank you all so much for inviting us to your campus and spending three hours with us. Um,